The following interview was conducted with Professor Alexander Sosansky, Professor Emeritus of Nuclear Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, November the 11th, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good morning to you and good afternoon from our end, Professor or Alex. Good morning. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your early years and parents? Well, we don't even want to get into all that. Okay. Do you want to just say a little bit about maybe school or a little bit about high school? How Was it a large school? or? I'll summarize this with just a few words. Okay. I, I was... Uh, born and brought up in upstate New York in a little town called Cloversville where they made gloves. Oh, wonderful. In 1921. Uh-huh. Okay. And then at uh, the age of about uh, eight, moved to New York City. Okay. To the Big Apple, right? To the Big Apple. <laughs> and then... Uh, my mother's health failed when I was 13, and she died. Oh, okay. So my father moved back to Gloversville, where I went to high school. Okay. And then uh, I was able to uh, obtain enough financial aid for the working class. Uh-huh. Parents to attend the rent of their Polytechnic Institute. Okay from which I graduated in chemical engineering okay. in 1941. Uh-huh. Actually, 42, right after Pearl Harbor. Oh, dear. OK. So I, my first uh, experience was making TNT in a plant in Niagara Falls, New York, which I which I. Uh, found very professionally useful in terms of the kind of work I was doing. Sure. And then uh, was recruited to work on the Manhattan Project. Okay. At Columbia University in 1943. Mm-hmm. And then was transferred to a facility in Decatur, Illinois, operated by Huda Hershey Corporation. Mm-hmm. Where uh, whose uh, assignment was to manufacture diffusion barrier material for Oak Ridge. Okay. And project. And then I, uh, during those years, I had a wish to go to graduate school, but couldn't because I was being deferred for uh, occupational responsibilities. Sure, okay. So, so as soon as the war was over, I went to work for one year with the Columbia Chemical Corporation in Barberton, Ohio. Uh-huh. And then I had an opportunity to go to graduate school, so went to the University of Rochester and earned a master's degree in chemical engineering was at, the t at that time, I was uncertain about continuing, but I was convinced by various people that I should take advantage of my situation and go on for a PhD. Sure, okay, sounds good. So, so I went on to the University of Delaware, which had just established a, a doctorate program in uh, chemical engineering and in chemistry sponsored by the DuPont Company, and they had some outstanding people there, mm -hmm. and graduated with my Ph.D. in 1950, Okay. which was at a time when President uh, well, it was decided that we should attempt to develop a hydrogen weapon. Okay. So I went to Los Alamos. Uh-huh. Let's see. After being involved in that work and the opportunity 
to participate in some early nuclear reactor development. Mm -hmm. I determined that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in Los Alamos. Okay. So I um, found that I had a marketable skill, namely the reputation of knowing something about nuclear engineering. Uh, my assignment was to develop the heat transfer system mm -hmm. or a, uh, a small demonstration reactor. So to make a long story short, I. Uh, sort of t uh, sampled the waters and found that I had something that I could offer for Drew. Okay. And uh, accepted a, a, pos a position at Purdue. A position at Purdue as an associate professor, not an assistant professor because of my qualifications. Uh huh. I, I had a professional engineering license from the state of Ohio. Okay. And then there was years of experience in research and development by then. Uh huh. So I was in the chemical engineering school. Okay. Because the when you came, the nuclear engineering school was not established. Is that correct? No, no. Okay. May I go ahead? Go ahead. You talk a little bit about whatever you were involved. Uh, that came to fruition. That's okay. I listen now. I found that uh, the force behind an interest in nuclear engineering was the then Dean of Engineering, George Hawkins. Okay. Purdue, who had been president of the American Association for Engineering Education previously mm -hmm. and close relationships with our National Laboratory. So, uh, For the next few years, he was sort of uh, someone who made sure I was active in nuclear engineering and Purdue would have a visibility in the field. Okay. Did uh, did you have? Yep. Go ahead. Sorry. So when I arrived at Purdue, I found that they had established a course called Nuclear Chemical Engineering in the School of Chemical Engineering. Okay. And I thought that this was a little premature since it was putting the cart before the horse because you needed to know something about nuclear technology mm -hmm. and uh, the nuclear reactors before you could deal with nuclear chemicals. So I established a course at Purdue called, which was Chemical Engineering 544, which was called the uh, introduction to nuclear reactor technology or something like that. Okay. And uh, to start it off, the then president of the Purdue found $25,000 to start off a program which included some laboratory work. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. However, I didn't start to teach this course until the spring semester having started it because they thought that uh, I needed that time to prepare myself. Sure. Spent the first semester teaching the junior course in, in chemical engineering thermodynamics, which came as a surprise to me since it's a pretty hard subject to teach. Oh, yeah. So I, they, I, I hear that. <laughs> uh, I had done my dissertation in that area. I, I was, there is an old saying that you don't understand thermodynamics until you try to teach it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good comment. <laughs> where were okay. you? Where were you located at that time? In the Chemi Building or Chemmet Building? What was known at that time? Is that yes. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. And uh, so the first semester went uh, okay, and I enjoyed the opportunity to do that. Uh-huh. Back to the $25,000 and what to do with it. There was a cost to be taught, of course, and uh, for that purpose, there were two textbooks that were available for then published. Oh, I should mention that although I came from Los Alamos and had been working on nuclear reactor technology, 
I knew practically nothing about reactive physics, though people didn't assume, didn't understand that at the time. Okay. But I had to learn what I had to teach. As proficient as it's, uh, the, at least the day before the class and that. Uh huh. So that was a tough going. Sounds so, like it. So I probably needed to have a laboratory. And an accompanying laboratory course. So the $25,000, part of that went to obtaining a uh, large, uh, powerful gamma ray source, which we got from, from uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. This was a popular way of getting experience Okay. Activity and uh, made a lot of people nervous because it was a dangerous situation. So I was able to find a place to look at this on the third floor of the chemical engineering building next to an old laboratory. Mm -hmm. And uh, had all sorts of monitoring equipment. So we paid for the source. Oh, uh, this was in the as an aside, this was on the third floor of the building, and the weight of this lead container to the source was about twice the capacity of the elevator. Oh my. So I worried about how we were going to get it up there. Right. So when was, everything arrived, physical plan just came along and took a look at the elevator. They said, oh, it'll be all right, and they, and they had it up there before I even got to the city. <laughs> you lucked out. <laughs> right. So what we did uh, to, together with a colleague in chemical engineering who was a, a, an expert in nuclear re in chemical reactions, we decided as a way of trying to do something with this, which was a popular w way of getting experience in. The in the nuclear engineering education at the time, instead of having a reactor, was to study the effect of gamma radiation on the reaction rate of some chemical reactions that we knew about. So we had this thing set up with a, a chemical reactor in the center of a cylinder, which was in the middle of this lead shield and attached to the plug that we pulled out carefully because we had to use a pole and so forth to be concerned about our own radiation during the train. Sure. Okay. And we had ever bells and whistles and Dean Hawkins was concerned that somebody would be in repairing the roof or something because there was a beam over there over there coming would be coming through the roof when we did this change. But he, he convinced, was convinced that we knew what we were doing. So that was all right. We actually had a, a, a uh, master's thesis based on measuring this radiation coming through the roof. But I had a student who attached the Geiger counter at the end of a long pole. And when he, he went up on the roof, and uh, by coordinating it, when the pull, when the uh, plug was pulled, was able to measure the radiation in the beam there. So we had that as a math. Yeah. Very good. Well, that that was a good thing to know. So that was our first experience. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was, it was something that uh, was worked well. Then we had a laboratory. Now this was before any mention was made of anything elsewhere. This was all within chemical engineering. And uh, so I found a unused space in the sub-basement of the Chem and Mint building. I didn't know there was a sub-basement there. <laughs> it was a floor below the actual basement, so it was way down which we turned into a, a laboratory with a lot of 
and not a lot, but uh, some essential measuring instruments for measuring different kinds of radiation. And bear in mind, I had, had no experience in doing this sort of thing before whatsoever. Okay. But the Oak Ridge National Laboratory had for years run a classified school at the Oak Ridge called the Oak Ridge School of Reactor Current Technology, which mm -hmm. is called ORCET, O-R-C. Uh-huh. And I found, I, I was able to get a manual for their experiments and to use the manual as a guide for using part of the $25,000 that I had available to buy some uh, equipment to make uh, appropriate measurements of radioactivity. Mm -hmm. So we have developed some lab experiments and so forth to go along with the course. Okay. So we had students that did this, again, completely within chemical engineering for a few years. And I should mention accompanying this. You see, at Purdue in those days, they had Saturday morning classes. Oh, okay. I don't know if you're aware, you were aware of that or not. Oh, I, I, yes, I am. <laughs> so what I was able to do was get some money from Dean Hawkins for a course that was offered Saturday mornings, which we would pay expenses, modest expenses, for various people from Argonne National Laboratory who could accept money because it was on Saturday morning and not during their working hours. Uh-huh. Well, we had about uh, a course that uh, was called N Nuclear Engineering uh, or something or other. Mm -hmm. And showed movies that was available that were made by the AEC at the time, as well as talks given by well-known people at Argonne National Laboratory who were just delighted to do this for us for about a hundred dollars, including expenses for the, mor for the morning, and we gave them lunch. And uh, Dean Hawkins was interested, he accompanied us for lunch for uh, many cases, so this was a way, marvelous way for me to get acquainted with some of the key people from Argonne. Sure. And to get acquainted with Purdue and to uh, get the dean involved. Sure. And it was, uh, this was a credit course that uh, uh, you had to be pretty, uh, work pretty hard not to get, uh, not to get past the grade, let's say that. Uh, we gave it a nominal exam of sorts and so forth based on what you did. Uh-huh. Uh, so forth which was a way of justifying the money that we were spending because we were, so you had the money we were giving a course and we were just paying somebody. Sure. So it worked well for us. Good, good. And it's, it's like this. So we had about 40 students, believe it or not, they en enrolled in this as part of their chemical engineering work. Uh-huh. And in, in the subsequent year or two, the engineer, engineering science, School of Engineering Sciences at Purdue, Included this nuclear engineering course that I gave as part of the required curriculum. So we had students from engineering science as well as chemical engineering mm -hmm. to the point of view that uh, after a few years we had to have another section of this for chemical engineering 544. And one of the newer assistant professors said, in chemical engineering was divided to uh, have to learn to do this. So it was quite, it was quite an operation. Sounds like it, yes. And Getting the thing from ground up. Yes, <laughs> this was before we got it, people involved in the, mm -hmm. from other departments. Okay. So when I do the only other activity in nuclear engineering, so-called, was given by a professor in physics. Okay in the Oak Ridge, but his interest was primarily in reactive physics pride and not in, not in the engineering phase, which Purdue was 
and one other for the, as it is part of the boiler maker, and we do things and have locomotives and stuff and don't want to mm -hmm. work too hard about it. Uh, obscure theory, shall we say. So now, uh, I don't remember the exact chronology, mm -hmm. but uh, we involved some people and other schools of engineering to teach parts of what had to be done. Mm -hmm. We ended up with a interdisciplinary committee Okay. to supervise all this. And the dean was quite helpful and was able to get Stuart McLean, who was well known from Argonne, and to sort of chair the, this committee. Mm -hmm. So we had it essentially for a fair few years, all the work going on in, in chemical engineering, and they had a laboratory in the chemical engineering building, the basement. And I should also mention we had a technician, which was important to, to, be, to maintain the equipment. Okay, and that's needed. That turned out to be a gem. He was a graduate. He, he was. He, he was in. A, in a, in the Navy uh, as a technician program and was a freshman in electrical engineering. Uh huh. And had been sent over for us, someone as a possibility. And I employed him for four years and we kind of became good friends. And uh huh. And always oh, another interesting thing this uh, laboratory I had in the basement was sort of out of the way of the place. So the, the technician Bill Smith was using the place in the evening to repair TV sets for people. So we, so we had a little business going that nobody <laughs> knew about. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well then, uh, I think it was 1960. Okay. When uh, we moved along to a better level with uh, Phil Powers being appointed as head of the new department of nuclear engineering, which is the department of the school, with the work completely at the graduate level. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil Powers had established something called the Internuclear Corporation in St. Louis, Missouri, which was competing for uh, design contracts offered by the Atomic Energy Commission. They were particularly involved with a reactor that was being built for the University of Missouri. And uh, so he, his background, although it was in physics, had been more of an administrative entrepreneur type individual. So he so this is uh, then head of the new department of nuclear engineering and spent most of his time with the Purdue Research Foundation and some sort of assistant uh, dean or whatever it was that they had established for him. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And his office was in the as well as in Hussey Hall now, uh, in uh, the engineering uh, dean's area, engineering administration building. Okay. So, uh, time moves along. Sure. And uh, we you developed do you want to, would you want to mention, um, you were the acting head uh, from what, for yes. several years? No, uh, this was when? About 66, perhaps? So far as, well, before that, Okay. I, I was sort of uh, involved in administrating some of the things that we had to as a department. Sure. Uh, we had a space 
But then we had a few faculty members, and we had office space with Michael Gold and Lance. Okay. And uh, Phil Powers had uh, then offered, been offered a job as president of the Argonne University Association, which was an association of 34 universities or something like that which were then uh, associated with Argonne National Laboratory. And he went down to a minimal part-time effort for Purdue, and I served as assistant head. Okay. Or acting head, as it may actually. Mm -hmm. For all purposes, and sometimes he would be gone for, for a week, and I didn't know he was even out of town, so. You so carried fine. on. <laughs> but uh, this uh, arrangement had sort of some problems in terms of the time I could devote to this because I was still carrying a full teaching mode and uh, had to do research and students and all that and satisfy the dean and attend his meetings. So it wasn't all that great, great a job. and. Kept you pretty busy. So I, I should also mention that the problem we had was we were a very small effort compared with the schools like electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, which had a faculty of 100 or so. So the dean would t t take his expenses and divided by the number of faculty, which were not very many or whatever, we were very expensive. So there was always pressure to find money to do what needed to be done. Sure. Yeah. We believe that we were running the department sometime with the help of raising income from the Xerox machine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh. we're, we're, the, uh, the department only allowed one automatic, automatic copier in a, in a given building. So we had a copier and do charge 10 cents a copy to people using the machine for other oh. departments. And it only cost us a few pennies to run it. Any, uh, go ahead. Then after that was when Professor Lykoudis came, correct? No, we have we go through okay. a phase of uh, professors like Goodis came. About yeah. 73, perhaps? When, whenever it was that. Uh, okay. Powers finally got out of being the president of AUA, the Argonne Association. Okay. Uh, we knew this was coming, so we had we had. It a, I don't remember just the, the way it worked out. Okay. So, the dean decided that he didn't want to pay for. It. I think we had a search committee for a new head. Uh huh. But the dean then decided that he didn't want to go outside of the group to pay another salary. Uh huh. He wanted somebody on the payroll already to be head. That's how we got like Kudis. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm worried about that. How did the, um, uh, were you still, the enrollment, had in, did it, that increase over time, student enrollment? Well, we had, in the meantime, yes, we had, in okay. the meantime, we developed an undergraduate program as well as a graduate program. Okay. Were you, were you involved in both the undergraduate and the graduate program? Oh, yes, my. Okay. My classes were, included some of the graduates as well as graduates. Okay. And I was developing a, New courses too all the time. Sure. And that takes quite a bit of time. Well, there were other faculty there. There were 
And it, well, I should back off a little bit. We uh, were able to get a laboratory space developed in the uh, Duncan Annex of the Electrical Engineering Building when it was revised, and we had a laboratory in the basement. Okay. And uh, we had received in one year or another, and before that, a government grant for equipment for nuclear engineering education, uh -huh. which we had chosen to use instead of other schools who used that for the getting a, a small nuclear reactor. But we chose to use it for using two heat transfer loops one involving boiling water and the other involving liquid metals, which is my major area of interest at the time. And also the So we had, uh, and, and there was an office space there, space in the Duncan Annex, which was also used uh, okay. for a family member. Now, in thinking about this, it turned out over the years that this was not the best decision to make, that is, to use the money for these heat transfer loops, which proper decision. I was able to use the space uh, and, and the liquid metal for some research. But uh, the Professor Bergdahl was involved in this from the School of Mechanical Engineering mm -hmm. in the water loop. And he didn't have a large interest in research anymore. He had done that during the war. So uh, it was not the best use of space. We would have been better off at the time to use a reactor, use it for a reactor. We got a reactor eventually, but it had to be, it was paid for by Purdue. So that was $100,000 for the hmm. didn't necessarily have do that. And uh, a few words about the liquid metal loop that uh, I was interested in. I put out quite a few research efforts in uh, several PhDs and so forth. Uh -huh. A mercury loop in a space in which the sodium, na the so-called sodium potassium loop was in, not used a lot. And in subsequent years, oh, we got rid of the water loop early. Uh -huh. But uh, there wasn't much we could do with the sodium loop because it would plug up and the sodium would react with the moisture in the air. And uh, I'd run it a couple of times a year just to exercise it, but I was nervous that uh, something would leak and we'd have a fire and there would be all sorts of problems. Uh -huh. So uh, as the years went by, and this was quite a few years, I was able to get the people in Argon interested in the loop because they were using it for uh, some other work. And they were happy to come down and just take it away from us. Oh, okay. That's what we do. But the professor like Kudis was head of the school, and we had collaborated on some research of this. Uh huh. When he he went on a year sabbatical, and I was going to do research for him. And anyway, to make a long story short, uh, he insisted that we should keep it for his own possible use. So, uh, uh, 10 years after retiring, I came back to Purdue for a short uh, visit, gave a talk and so forth. The then head of the department was Professor Ransom, who told me that this night rope was still, that the sodium rope was still turning out to be a big expensive headache and they had to get rid of it, it was gonna cost us a lot of money. So uh, I think that was one of the things that 
he and uh, that one talked about food that I disagreed on and uh, I'm happy to know that at this time because he's back in peace. So anyway, that's the story. Okay. All right. Sounds okay. Um, let's see. Uh, go ahead. Did you cover you covered most of your career highlights that you had indicated? This sounds good. Yeah, oh, one, one it just occurred to me. Okay. Uh, you will see that uh, Paul Waterlet gets a copy of this. Big pardon? Paul Waterlet, he's, he's a major contributor to the department. He's given the name professorship now. Oh, okay. And I know that Paul Waterlet is one of our graduates who became the the uh, managing partner for uh, Sides in the Mundi Corporation, which is a major contractor, presumably made, a, made enough money to have a named professorship for him. Very nice. Very nice. My very good wishes. That's wonderful. <laughs> that was about a million dollars and go up from there. <laughs> very nice. Um, he was one of our graduate students, and I'm sure would uh, be interested in this. I don't know the complete agreement the way these current schools moving. A couple things. What are you doing in your retirement, the retirement activities, besides keeping busy? I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> Do you come? Have you been back to Purdue at all, sir? Well, yeah, I came back. Yes, I came back ten years after I retired. Oh, did you? Okay, okay. Well, the uh, campus has grown probably since then. <laughs> yes, I gave the talk, and uh, the students were impressed. And, oh, we haven't gotten into my book situation. Sure. All right, okay. Um, do you have an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us? You can have more yeah. than one. Anything that comes to mind? Did you get this uh, little description of the first test of the hydrogen bomb? Okay, yes. Yes, that you sent that to me. That's very nice. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate you sending that to me. Uh, that was something that... Uh, that's quite an experience. It was scary, but it was a privilege to be with all these. Sure. Famous guys. Right. Um, and along those lines, uh, Dr. Lusset, have you ever heard of Enrico Fermi? Yes. Yes. He's, he's the father of the whole Tommy project, which one who had the first reactor and all that. Oh, there's another little story, I guess, that goes along with that. Here I arrived at Los Alamos, complete with a brand new PhD. And uh, they look forward to being called doctor and so forth. It's told in Los Alamos that nobody in Los Alamos gets called doctor because there are too many PhDs, except medical doctors. Uh huh. So here I'm near the library, uh, laboratory, and this loudspeaker suddenly comes forth and saying, Mr. Fermi, will you please call the operator? Here, Enrico Fermi, Nobel Prize winner, granddaddy of them all is being called Mr. <laughs> I thought it was all right, sir. If he was called Mr. It was all right for me to be called Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Go ahead. Sent off to Anna Wintock to develop something ready for the test and was told that you have to use a doctor then to impress the military. So I was Dr. Zazansky there for the month I was there. So that was <laughs> okay. Is there anything that I, that I forgot to ask or that you'd like to um, comment on? Anything further? Well, something uh, I missed? The biggest event which affected my career enormously was my book, uh -huh. uh, Association. The one with, you wrote with Samuel Gladstone? 
that book? Yeah. Okay. My cell phone is ringing. I'm going to ignore it, but it's making a big noise right now. So okay. Stop. All right. Okay. We're right. Go ahead. Yes, the book. Is that the book with you, that you co-authored with Samuel Gladstone? Yes. That's yes. That certainly got all kinds of, you know, awards and things like that. It's the first one. Well, uh, I can explain a little bit more about that. Uh huh. I said when I started teaching at Purdue, there were just two books available. Big pardon? Dean Hawkins. Uh huh. Had obtained a draft of a new book that was being sponsored by the Atomic Energy Commission based on a lot of people's contributions who had been working at Oak Ridge. So, Gladstone was more of an editor than an author. But working with Gladstone, he takes material like this from different sources. And we write it all in his own wrong hand and doesn't uh, uh, write anything he can't understand. Mm. So it, it works to the point where I learned an awful lot by collaborating with him. <laughs> what happened was Dean Hawkins had been getting a draft of some of this manuscript, which he turned over to me when I was interested in, uh, when I needed it for my work and so forth. I didn't know that the effort even existed. So I was interested in this. And as soon as the book was published, that for which Gladstone was writing was about my having anything much to do with it. I was immediately adopted it because it was just what I wanted, just what I needed. It explained things that I didn't even know myself. So after a year or so of using the book, I wrote to, I wrote to Gladstone saying, uh, here are some suggestions for the next revision of the book. So after a year or so after that, I thought I went, I know Gladstone was going to be at Los Alamos. I was going to be there for the summer. So I went to look, I went to see him. So it turned out that I was the only one that had the courage to offer any suggestions. He was really interested in finding a collaborator in the academic business. So one thing led to another, and I was offered to be a co-author in the next revision. Oh, uh huh. So he changed the title from Principles of Nuclear Engineering, which he had, to uh, just Nuclear Engineering. And uh, a friend who was then the head of the nuclear engineering department at MIT, who I had known for a, a while, Manson Benedict. I mean, next time he saw me, he said, I like this a lot better now. <laughs> well, that's a nice little story about the book. <laughs> it went on for 30 years, though, and after Gladstone died at age 89, I got a call from Van Ostrin just after it. Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait, which was in the early 90s, you may remember. And he wanted to put out another edition of the book. So I said, yes, I'd be interested in doing it by myself. It turned out that uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, not, not the Department of Energy, or maybe it wasn't yet, had the copyright, and they were not interested in supporting the book any longer. See, they had, it, it was a very really inexpensive book for us to pay for the competition because it was being subsidized by the government. Oh, okay. All these years. And I should also mention, while using the book, backing off a while, 
I have written a book all by myself called uh, Nuclear Reactor Design Analysis or something like that, which was a book that supplemented the other book and was intended for engineers understanding the decisions that went on, which was published by the Department of Energy and subsidized and was available for a 450 page book, which is the thick paperback, and that sold for about $12 or $15, which is unheard of in those days. And that's still available from Amazon. It's still not in print any longer, but you can buy it. And it really costs more than the other books, yes. So, well, people haven't heard of it except in the two hours of it, and I was very much involved in it. Mm-hmm. Book, and then the other book all by myself. Okay. The power plant design analysis. So anyway, uh, it was a struggle to get the fourth edition published because Van Austin decided to go out of the technical book business. So the book bounced around as it was before anybody could work it out to publish it. It finally got published, but it cost more over a hundred dollars for the each volume of the two volume book. I knew it was gonna be expensive, so I said, no, well let's split it in two. It was rather than eight hundred pages, we made two books of four hundred pages. Mm-hmm. We make it more accessible depending upon the students who and me. One volume had pretty much a lot of most of the old stuff that was in the form of books. And uh, uh, the second volume was all pretty much completely new. So when I came back to Purdue 10 years after I had retired, the book had been published in here. One of the students, when my book came up, and wanted me to sign the book. How nice. Yeah. Good. And, and the book is still in print. Well, that's, that's good. It's in 94. And here it is, 2010, and it's still just available from the publisher. As the book by the same name, it just keeps chugging along like the little engine that could. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, anything uh, in closing that you'd like to say, or um, there was something I forgot to ask? Or you think we pretty much covered it? Well, I have, uh, I guess, some... Um, uh, thoughts about uh, the headship. Yeah, you made a couple of comments, but Professor Lycoudis was there for quite a while, yeah. The trouble with Professor Lycoudis, he a very smart and energetic man who was monumental in getting us building, building a nuclear engineering building from engineering scientists. Good role model, but he, he, he had no experience in, in the nuclear engineering community. It was, was unknown to people in the field, and I'd go to national meetings in the American Nuclear Society, and of course they never heard of it after I could. Hmm. So, this is, I think, one of the disadvantages of having a head that was not visible sufficiently in the field, mm-hmm. which is important. And currently, we have this head, somebody who is prominent in the field of nuclear fusion and then not nuclear power reactor technology. So well, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Oh, incidentally, I got a call a couple of our two old graduates. This is another story that I happen to be married to one another. One is a woman, of course. Uh-huh. And they're both working in Finland for the reactor being developed by the French company building it for Finland. And uh, so they were good enough to tell me what was going on. Sure. It's nice to keep in touch. Yes. Yes. Okay. And another thing that does concern me is the current emphasis away from what has been traditionally the Purdue. The 
the reputation of the, shall we say, the practicality of getting things done in their way that is not as esoteric as MIT does in many ways in terms of the kind of research they do. It's more appropriate to what the needs are of practicing engineers, shall we say. And there's certainly the, 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 probably a very brilliant man who was in the field of fusion rather than nuclear power reactors. Okay, all right. This is uh, in terms of the visibility to the industry. Mm -hmm. I don't know where nuclear power is going. And it's something I feel in terms of the national scene that uh, we have a number of companies who are major one has just dropped out because the government is charging them uh, apparently an unacceptable amount of money for the guarantee of uh, safety. Seemingly, they, they would do this for nothing. So here we have other countries developing the power plants, and we're discouraging commercial people from building the plant here mm -hmm. because of what amounts to no mm -hmm. to put the taxpayer money at just the, the, the uh, ability of the U.S. government to guarantee against the possible disaster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, I, th I want to thank you very much for your time. I have really enjoyed chatting with you. I feel like I've been sitting right across from you, okay? And uh, it'll be a little bit of a time before we'll send the transcript for you to look at, but we will send it to you, and then you can make any editorial changes you want to, and then send it back, and we'll give you a final copy. So and big, par about big pardon? A few words about Chernobyl, which you can Oh, say. go ahead. You were familiar with it, you know. Sure, it. I remember it. In uh, the Ukraine. Uh, because of my book with Glasgow, and I was a contractor for the 80s. Uh huh. Contractor. Which meant to get all sorts of reports on the distribution list. Yeah, yeah, the distribution list. So I received a report about it. We have to, in Leningrad. Which uh, was a design which is the same as the one in Chernobyl. It had a certain reactor characteristics, so I would assign students to evaluate this design as a, as a homework assignment. And so we all found it to be unsafe. So when Chernobyl happened, there was no surprise. And all the newspapers were calling up the department to say, hey, what was Chernobyl? Nobody knew anything about it. Uh -huh. They were waiting for me to go up and hey, I came and had some slides and all sorts of things. So I gave a lecture on Chernobyl to our, our faculty first. So I, I, I well, I was, I would say probably the first in the, in the educational industry, if you want to call it that, who was concerned about Chernobyl before it happened. Okay, okay. Well, that was a, that's a nice addition to the to your interview, and I appreciate that. Okay, well, uh, I could go on, of course, because I have a lot of memories about it. I think we really you really covered quite a bit, and you give us a nice snapshot and and uh, ideas and how they. Department school got started, and for that I'm most appreciative. Well, thank you for thank, your Thank you very much, and don't, I sent you that IRB, so if you get a chance, send, sign it and send it back to me, okay? The yes. little form I sent out, if not, I'll send you another one. And I want to yes. wish you and your family a nice holiday, starting with Thanksgiving. Yes, my daughter lives here, she's coming over. Oh, okay, to... that sounds good. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, well I do too, and I want to thank you, and I'll give your regards to uh, Bruce Dowd. Okay. Okay. Thanks again now. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>